grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, the text for our sermon this evening is recorded in that epistle lesson that we read uh, just a little bit earlier. I am condensing it a little bit down to verses uh, 35 and following. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, are you afraid of anything that you care to admit? A little spider, spider or insect crawling up the walls? I know some people don't like them. What about the mouse that crawls around in the basement or up in the attic? What if it crawls out on the floor? Do you run and jump for high ground? What are the things that we are afraid of? The dark? Sounds that come out of the dark? Some people are afraid of heights. I'm afraid of closed spaces. We all have something that we have this uncontrollable fear about. Many in our society today are beginning to become more and more concerned, more and more afraid, I might even say, about the so-called forecast ended end of the world. Many people are afraid of becoming poor. Many people are afraid of being lonely. We are afraid of many things, real or imagined. We are afraid of many things. We try to deal with those fears. Oh, we make movies about the things we're afraid of. Uh, we use shows, and some of the popular shows on TV, one I saw just, or just saw it advertised is The Walking Dead. The zombies, ghost hunters, we make movies about monsters. I don't know why. Maybe it's because that we know it's just a movie, it's not real, it's just entertainment, and we can walk away from it. We try to deal with our fears, say, in even the festival of Halloween. People dress up in all of these scary costumes. And it's funny then, and we can pretend that it's not really that terrifying. But I'm telling you, when you have one of those bad dreams that something is chasing you, something you can't get away from, something you fear and dread is going to happen, that's scary. It's so real. We have many things that we fear in this world. And it's part of our sinful nature. We just can't get away from it. And I don't care how brave you claim to be that nothing frightens you, there is something about which you will be terribly frightened. Is that faith? You know, is that what believers should be doing yet we have fears we try to deal with them we try to ignore them forget them push them away and yet we have fears in fact President De uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his inauguration speech in 1932 acknowledged that 
The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Acknowledging that we have fears. Recall the days when he was president, depression, upcoming wars, things were not good. The things we fear today are much the same. Being poor, losing the things we have, being alone, not being liked or accepted. We fear disease. We fear our sins. Because we know we are sinners. Many of the same sins over and over and over again. We, we just can't seem to stop. How could God possibly love a person like me? Oh, I know he's accepted me back many times, but when is he just going to say, that's it, I've had it. You've taken advantage of me. We fear that. And this may be one of the reasons why even good believers can even fear death. Fearing that maybe they'll stand before God and hear him say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Our fears can be our greatest enemy. They can make us not be confident in God and lead us into many sins just to try and overcome them. And that's where the words of the Apostle Paul come in so wonderful today, in today's world, with our lives and everything that's going on. And look at all the things Paul mentions there. All the things that were causing concern and uh, fear in people. And he's simply saying, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear something to hang on to something to remember we don't have anything to really be afraid of not even fear itself why Paul says it in this portion of scripture if God is for us who can be against us who can harm us who can hurt us well, how do we know that God is for us? And I think Paul made that abundantly clear also in this uh, chapter of Romans. Before the world was created, God knew you would one day exist. And he chose you to be his child to be a member of his family, to be a member of his kingdom. We call that predestination. You are confirmed in the kingdom of God and were confirmed so before you even were here. And then according to his promise to Adam and Eve in the garden, God sent his only son he asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, but stopped him just in the nick of time. But God did not do that for himself. He sacrificed his son. Jesus took on human flesh and gave up his life on the cross for your sins. And then he justified you. That means that in God's court, the record of your lives were to be opened up and you're expecting to see the record of sins and disobediences and unbelief and lack of love. You expect to see a sin 14 miles, or a list 14 miles long. 
but the record book is clean. You have been pronounced innocent of any guilt because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, after Jesus had risen from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. And there, he intercedes for you. He is your representative in the kingdom of heaven at the right hand of God. God listens to you. God forgives you. God provides for you takes care of you, protects you, blesses you because of his love for you and because his son is right there next to him reminding God, I died for them. God is on your side. And if that weren't enough, Paul even goes ahead and talks about how God makes all things work together for good to those who love him. Even the phone ringing right now. And he stopped it. God makes all things work together for good to those who love him. Think back in your lives. All the experiences you've had, good and bad, how God has woven them all together. How God has used them to maneuver you and to maneuver things in life. He brought you here tonight as a result of all of the interactions, of all of the experiences you've had. You are here tonight because you love Him. You're here to worship Him, to give Him praise and thanksgiving to repent of your sins and he accepts you you have been led to this point by all of the combined experiences that you've had up until the present and God's going to make sure it keeps on going that way everything will work together for your physical well-being now in this life and for your eternal well-being in the kingdom of glory. God is on your side. If God is for us, who can be against us? You know, one other thing that we do fear is that God might not love us because of our sins again. But here again, the Apostle Paul says, Nothing will ever be able to take us away from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in a social, with the social problems of this world, trouble or hardship or persecution, the difficulties we have in getting along with one another socially sometimes, the way we hurt one another's feelings, the way we persecute one another or feel persecuted, Boy, if that's the way people feel about me, I wonder how God feels about me. God says, don't sweat it. Or what about the other problems of this world? Famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Maybe more modern terms would be hunger, poverty, violence, and yes, warfare. These are things that keep touching our lives. Keep being strong temptations to lead us to, for example, wonder, you know, if God really is in control. Why does he let things happen like this if he is? But God reminds us these things will never be able to take us away from his love. You know, Paul said it here, we are more than conquerors. I keep thinking of another popular uh, set of programs on TV today, uh, Raw. Any of you know what I mean by that? Wrestling. 
and it's quite popular on several channels. How many of you watch it? Okay, we got one honest person back here. <laughs> okay. I personally don't watch it. But I've seen enough of the advertising for it to kind of get a feel, at least, for what it's about. And the reason I don't watch it, I used to watch wrestling from way back when, when that wrestling was in its infancy. And it seems to me that, well, I could just as easily go and watch a movie where all the characters know their parts, they act their parts, they say their lines. When there's action involved, they get involved. When there's violence that's called for, they go through with that. And that, to me, is what wrestling is all about. And yeah, the favorite guy, he gets down on the mat sometimes, right? Looks beaten, defeated. And all of a sudden, with one big burst of energy, he will get up and smack his opponent, deck him hard, and end up winning the fight. I would call that a fixed fight, wouldn't you? It's all scripted, all choreographed, all predetermined. Well, you know, in the struggles and the fears that we have with the evils and the temptations and the troubles out in the world that make us afraid, all we have to remember is that the fight is fixed. You know, how many wars have been fought where, you know, one side, they're fighting a battle, they lose a battle, they lose a battle here or there, whatever, but they end up winning the war. And yeah, for a time it looked as if Christ had been beaten as he's hanging there on the cross dying. But in that death was Satan's defeat. The fight was fixed. From the day God made the promise in the Garden of Eden, the script was written. Satan could do his best to try and defeat God's plan, but it didn't happen. And don't forget, if God is for you, who can be against you? Certainly not even Satan himself. Nothing, nothing in heaven or hell or anywhere in between, the past, the present, or the future angels or demons, nothing. Not even presidents and kings and dictators will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Human love is fickle, isn't it? You know, been to weddings where, you know, the couple promises their undying love for one another for as long as they live and two years later they're getting divorced because they can't stand one another's guts. Our relationships are like that. Our love is like that. But not God's. God's love is unconditional, unswerving, unfailing. And it's there for us, like the air we breathe. Anytime we are feeling fearful, for whatever reason, anytime we are feeling being beaten down, broken, and defeated, we know that God's love is there to comfort us and give us hope to strengthen us and give us courage to do that which is right, to pick us up when the world knocks us down. God's love will always be there. And there's a passage in 2 Corinthians that Paul also writes, chapter 4, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, 
but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So no matter what happens in this world, how troubling it gets, how much sorrow it creates and frustration and temptation, know this. You have nothing to fear because God is always here. And, you know, it, as I was practicing that sermon this afternoon, the additional thought came to me. Back in the 60s, there was an old cartoon that we watched diligently. Mighty Mouse. Some of you older people remember Mighty Mouse? What was Mighty Mouse's theme song? Here I come to save the day. We can count on God for that. Amen.